Hello everyone, I am back with a congressional candidate who you may know from last year. He's running again in 2022. It's a rematch against Yvette Clark. I am of course talking about Isaiah James running in New York's 9th congressional district. Isaiah, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. I'm finally on the air after all the technical difficulties. There, I feel like every single interview I do, there's like at least three technical difficulties and five attempts. Um, <laughs> One day we're gonna have a really solid setup where there's no issues. I, I swear. <laughs> you, might, you might actually have an actual studio, like a building somewhere. Yes. So that way, you know, where you have an entire staff, and then they can handle those problems. With like people who know what they're doing, and not me, yeah. where I'm just like clicking furiously. All I know how to do is refresh the computer, like start over. That's all I do. Turn it <laughs> off and turn it on. That's all my my technical capacity, like it, it's limited to like blowing on the NAS cartridges and putting it sure. back in. Like that's as much as I know how to fix anything related to technology. Uh, but either way, uh, it's working, and I'm so glad to have you back on. So I've got to ask you: You're running for Congress again. You haven't even really had time to recover since your first run, I'm assuming, because you've just been like constantly like on the run, on the go. Uh, what made you want to run again? Um, what made me want to run again is because nothing changed from my last run you know my last run ended uh june of 2020 when we didn't win and honestly i i, I took a step back from not well i the campaign was over i took a step back from social media i didn't really post anything i just watched to see if the member of congress Yvette clark who i ran against was going to actually do something or say something or change the way she was you know thinking that our campaign, if we didn't win, at least we pushed her further to the left. At least we moved the Overton window in conversation. And the same corporate interests are running her and everybody else in the corporate Democratic Party. So, I mean, it's like, wait a minute, nobody's going to... She didn't change. Nothing changed at all. Nothing. And things have only gotten worse. I mean, when I ran, I was running during the beginning of the pandemic. I, I started my run and the pandemic hit last February, last March. And now we're here we are a year later and things are demonstrably worse and she hasn't changed so i think that even more so now our message resonates because people are starting to see wait a minute the nation's billionaires added like 1.5 trillion to their wealth and we can't even get a two thousand dollar check from our own government so that's what made me want to run again yeah, I feel like this pandemic, uh, not that we needed more proof that the system is broken, but it really like if you had doubts before, I mean, now it's shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that like if the richest people in this country get even richer during a pandemic, when in theory, everyone should be suffering. I mean, that system is indefensible. And to not have people in government actually want to fight, or at least they 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 say they want to fight, but they don't actually take meaningful action. I think it warrants, you know, a, a rematch. And I will say that a rematch, it, I feel like it, it's always a good idea because you don't always win on the first try. This was the case for Ro Khanna, for Cori Bush. Cori Bush had like a 20-point swing, I think, the second time she ran. Oh, yeah, she lost by, I mean, Cori Bush and I were both endorsed by brand new Congress. Me, Cori Bush, Jamal Bowman, AOC, all of us were on the same. We were on what they call the New York slate. So mm. not, not Cori Bush, obviously, but. The other ones, were, we were all in New York State, so we all met each other. You know, I met Corey a few times. You know, I talked to Corey, talked to Jamal. And her first election, she lost by, like, over 50,000 votes. Yeah. But she saw that it wasn't about running to get, you know, celebrity or some name recognition. It's about running because you actually want to make a difference in the people's lives who you're running to represent. And the second time around, she got over the hurdle. And now the people of her district are... Are, um, are more blessed because of it, because yeah. they actually have a representative who actually cares, who's a nurse, who's an organizer, who's a BLM activist, who, who cares about the same things that I talk about, because she's lived them. That's why when me and her talk, I call her my big sister, because she reminds me so much of my big sister. Literally, they're about the same age, and my sister has two kids just like her. So, I mean, the yeah. fact that she went again shows that it's, it's not about it's not about winning on the first try. It's about fighting for what you believe in. And if you truly believe in these things, and if you have the capacity to run, then why wouldn't you run again? Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like um, the number one thing that really 
is make or break. Um, it, it's money, of course, that's a huge factor, but name recognition is, is so incredibly important. Like I remember I talked to Cori Bush back in uh, 2017, I think it was, when she was running for the very first time. And then I talked to her again when she just launched her second run and she was talking about how it was like really difficult. It was a rough start. The day that I talked to her, she said we brought in $15 the day before. Uh, but what she did, little by little, was uh, reach out to people, improve her name recognition, and she really got a hold of her community and her district. And that made all the difference. And sometimes it takes more time to build up your name recognition because, I mean, you, you folks are you're, you're running for Congress and you're reaching out to thousands upon thousands, if not hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, thousands of people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's not an easy task, especially no. when you don't have the resources of the incumbent. So I think that, like, if, if folks are really serious about running for Congress, this is a commitment to not just run once, but you're running like two three times because this is a lot of work to do it the way that you're doing it like yes. if you took large uh contributions from like corporations oh you can get your name out there like that it'd be but, it'd be it'd be easy if i did that but totally. this is the thing so last cycle i am so proud of my team and even during the midst of a pandemic with absolutely no money and just a grassroots scrappy team we spent get this we spent thirteen thousand dollars and got over 10,000 votes, which is, if you know anything about New York primaries, if you get 10,000 votes for a first time candidate with absolutely no name recognition, 10,000 of my neighbors said they believe in our message and they want us to carry it forward to Washington. That was monumental. Now other people in the race spent 50 and $60 per vote. They had literally a million dollars, a million and a half. We didn't have anything. We were grassroots. We can't, our main our main tool was to get out there and talk to people. And every, everybody knows New York got hit the hardest for, first. We were, we were the first ones hit. So March, April, May, all the months leading up until the election, we literally were sitting in house. We couldn't knock on a door. We couldn't talk to anybody. And everybody was scared and rightfully so. And we still got over 10,000 votes. Now people know how to live within the confines of a pandemic. And if you drive down the streets in New York, especially in my district, everybody's masked, everybody's social distance, but there are people out there now. So it will be that much easier coming with the name recognition this time and learning so much from the first campaign. It was like drinking through a fire hose upside down. It was learning so, so much from the first campaign. We have a really, really good shot to win this because there are enough young people and leftists in any district to swing that district. It's just mm -hmm. they need to be motivated. They need to be given not something to vote against, but a reason to vote, somebody to vote for. And that's what this campaign offers. It's not just, hey, vote for me because I'm the, the new young guy. It's vote for me because I'm in the same boat as you, and I want us to all row in the same direction. Yeah, and I honestly feel like um, a lot of grassroots candidates like yourself have the advantage going into 2022 because this is when a lot of liberals kind of tend to check out. Like a lot of folks who aren't necessarily hyper political, more, you know, privileged, uh, professional managerial class types, you know, they tune into presidential elections and they kind of demobilize um, during the midterms. This is when the grassroots, I think, can really remain activated and pounce, use this as a unique opportunity. And I wanted to get your take on um, the stimulus situation. Anyone who I've talked to uh, who was relying on the two thousand dollar checks have asked me, hey, do you know when the $2,000 checks are coming? And I always have to say, actually, now it's supposedly $1,400, I know. And uh, in terms of when it's coming, I don't know, um, maybe March, if we're lucky. Uh, what's been the response? Because I've been, I've been so furious seeing folks trying to downplay what was literally a lie. Like we were told $2,000. And I think that you know, uh, folks who are Democratic Party loyalists in media, they're trying to make it seem as if, oh, no, no, the left, they're being so unreasonable. We knew what Joe Biden meant. Of course, he meant 600 plus, you know, 1400. What's been the take from people in your district? Because anyone who I've talked to who was counting on that check is pissed. So look at it like this. If you look behind me, you see all these sight words for first graders and kindergartners. My wife is a public school teacher here in New York City in Brooklyn. So she teaches first graders and kindergartners. She's been working from home since the pandemic. Our living room table, which I'm sitting at right now, is also her classroom. So we're not people of, of large means. So we're still relying on those checks. To be honest with you, I still have not gotten a single check yet. 
I have not gotten a fourteen hundred dollar check. Have not gotten a twelve hundred. Have not gotten a six hundred. I have gotten not a single dime from Uncle Sam yet. So that's number one. Number two, the fact that we're arguing over fourteen hundred versus two thousand in the midst of a global pandemic where we just crossed the five hundred thousand death threshold—that is the problem. That's the root of the problem. We should be talking about two thousand dollar checks. For everyone, until this thing is over, what is a fourteen hundred dollar check going to do? What is a one time two thousand dollar check going to do? It's not going to do anything. If Joe Biden were to give me a fourteen hundred dollar check right now, that literally, literally doesn't even pay my rent. One month in New York City, living in a basement apartment, that doesn't even pay my rent. So what? If, so no, every other bill I have that I can't go to work to pay. Is that doesn't even affect? That just doesn't even pay rent. So we need to look at the crux of the problem. It's not the fact that the checks haven't gone out, which is a problem. It's the fact that we have people who are trying to to rob Peter to pay Paul because they don't want to come up off the money of these corporate dollars. Meanwhile, corporations are making out hand over fist. I just told you the billionaires added a, a trillion and a half dollars to their wealth. There are a couple billionaires in this country that have more wealth than the GDP of some nations. Billionaires in this country added 1.5 trillion to their wealth. Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, does not have a 1.5 trillion dollar GDP. Those few people have more money than millions of people in Haiti. The, the three richest people in this country have more money than the bottom 50 percent of people in this country, and that's the big problem that we don't even talk about. That's why I'm running for Congress is because. I don't want to stand up at a lectern and talk about $1,460 and $1,200 checks. I want to talk about closing all these goddamn corporate loopholes, bringing that money from overseas that is hiding in the Cayman Islands that Apple and Microsoft and all these corporations have over there so we wouldn't have to argue about $1,400 checks. There's $2.5 trillion sitting offshore that needs to be taxed right now from these American corporations. If it was brought back here, if our corporate tax rate was brought up from 22% where it's at now, to the 35, 40, 50 percent where it needs to be, then there would be no problem talking about our coffers, that we can't afford things. If we cut our military budget at 780 billion goddamn dollars, we would have the billions of dollars needed to give people checks until this pandemic is over. So that's when when I don't I don't see things from the, the street level. I see things from the 10,000 foot level. That's why I'm running for Congress, because I see all these problems and we need to step away from the forest so we can see the trees, so we can get these big, bold ideas into people's into people's mindset. It's not about because they make you think the pie is so small that you have to fight for those scraps of fourteen hundred dollars. Other countries are paying people every single month until that thing, this thing is over. And we have the biggest GDP in the world. If New Zealand and England and France and Germany and, Ch and Japan and South Korea and Canada, they can do it, why can't America do it? Why do we, we lead the, we lead the world in gun homicides. We lead the world in, in obesity. We lead the world in locking people up and military spending. We never lead the world in social, in, in, in social safety net things. We don't lead the, the world in feeding the homeless and, and clothing the hung, uh, clothing the poor and, 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 Picking people out of poverty. How can we never lead the world in those things? Only the bad categories. That's what I have to think about. That we need to we need to start thinking big, grand ideas, because this piecemeal stuff we're doing is not going to work. It's obviously not working. We need to go. We need to swing for the fences, and we can't hope anymore. We can't wish anymore. We can't pray anymore. We have to be audacious. We have to demand that our government do these damn things, because this government is supposed to be buying for the people, and right now it's buying for the powerful. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that because it really matters to put things into perspective, like the mere fact that we're talking about like the price of the check when we're not already when we haven't already been getting monthly checks. It really is absurd in the richest country exactly. on the planet. It's weird like to think about this, that we allow this and that we're, we're kind of just accustomed to it and we expect it and we're not surprised by it. that really speaks to the failure of our system as a whole. And, and like, I, I'm glad that you're running on this message of demand better because when you have this much wealth in one country the fact that more or less wealthy countries are putting us to shame like we should all be embarrassed i know i am you know so i'm glad that folks like you are running for congress and explaining to people how they're getting a bad deal in comparison in comparison with our neighbors like even north of the border like canadians are getting monthly income 
throughout the duration of the pandemic. They have single payer health care, whereas in America, people with COVID don't even know how they're going to pay their medical bills. So exactly. it's it's outrageous. It really is. And to your point uh, or to what you said about you haven't received your stimulus uh, or your survival checks at all. I want to ask you a question. Has your representative reached out to assist people uh, in getting their checks? Like, have you heard anything? Because this is what a representative is supposed to do to folks in their district. So what help has been offered to you by Representative Yvette Clark? Absolutely none. You know, during the election, I'm when I ran against her, I'm still her constituent. I would get her mailers. I'm running against her. I would get her mailers in my mailbox. Every week or two, we got a new mailer from her. I haven't seen a single piece of mail from Congresswoman Yvette Clark talking about, hey, this is how you get through this pandemic. This is the number you can call. You have the money to send out the mailers during campaign time. Why aren't you sending out mailers now? I mean, I'm still your constituent. Even though I ran against you, you're still supposed to be working to help me and my family's life and everybody else's life in this district be better. I haven't heard a single word from her at all. She's talking about technology this and making smart cities that and Listen, all that's good, but we need to focus on what's happening right now. People are dying. We just crossed the 500,000 death threshold. I just had a conversation with my father, who's 72 today, and he lives down in Florida. I was like, when are you going to get the vaccine? He's like, I don't know. There's nobody talking to us. There's nobody telling us. And my dad has been in the house for over a year, 72, can't go anywhere because he has a, he had a bypass surgery, got a bad heart, all that stuff. He can't even leave his house. I just had a conversation with him this morning. He called me at 10 this morning and we were talking about stuff. And I was like, when are you going to get the vaccine? He has no idea. I don't have my wife's a teacher in New York City. Months have gone by. She still hasn't gotten the vaccine and she has a compromised immune system. The reason why she's working from home. I have pre-existing conditions from the from my time in Iraq. Heard nothing about the vaccine. This is what we're talking about. We have 500,000 reasons for a single payer health care system. In this country right now, we just crossed that mark. That's 500,000 reasons. We got 40 million reasons for a single payer health care system. The people who were without, without insurance. We have 335 million reasons for a single health care system because everybody in this country deserves it. That's why I'm saying we haven't heard. And imagine if my representative, Congresswoman Clark, the woman who I'm running against, got on the floor of Congress and said these things. She's a member of Congress. She can call a press conference with CNN, MSNBC, Fox, ABC, CBS, everybody. Imagine if she used her voice to elevate the people in her district. She's silent. If you go to her government website, Clark.gov or whatever it is, you can see the last time she put out press releases on housing, criminal justice, health care was 2017. That was four years ago. There's never her website. Heck, now think about it. I can't, I don't have regular access to you because you work in Washington. So my way of reaching you would be either to go to your office or to go to your website to leave you a, me a message. If I go to your website and you haven't said anything about the issues that are affecting me in four years during the midst of a housing crisis, in the midst of a pandemic, I have to assume that you do not care. Because if these things aren't at the forefront of your mind, they're damn sure at the forefront of mine because I'm living them every day. One would have to assume you don't care. So she does not care. I'm left to, to, to conclude she does not give a damn. Yeah, you know, it's sad that the folks who are running for Congress as insurgent candidates are doing more than their elected officials. Like we saw this all throughout the 2020 election. You were doing more. Uh, Adam Christensen in Florida, Donna Imam in Texas. Like I saw all of these candidates uh, trying to distribute information to their would-be constituents if they won about how to access PPP loans if they're a small business, uh, if they haven't gotten their stimulus check, uh, where to go, how to reach out, um, how to make sure sure you get that. It's just honestly, it's really frustrating that the party who in theory is supposed to be the party of the working class, which is the joke, but I mean the party who in theory should be the party of the working class, they're not looking out for their constituents and they're talking about these weird things like futurizing like, you know, the country and whatnot and, you know, I just I, I don't understand how well I guess I do understand. I, I just am shocked that they don't even try to pretend like they care. Like they don't they care don't. about the optics. We know that they're out of touch because they're elites and you know they're in DC, they're in that bubble, and the longer you stay in DC, the more you probably get out of touch. But like you'd think that they'd at least think about the op the optics. They're they're 
they just don't care at all. Um, I, I do want to switch gears a little bit, and I'm a little bit apprehensive to even ask this question because um, it's been incredibly divisive, but I wanted to get your take on your strategy as a member of Congress. So there was a lot of controversy recently with members of the squad for refusing to support a floor vote on Medicare for all. And I just wanted to kind of get a sense of what your strategy would be in terms of Democratic Party leadership. Um, would you, in your opinion, be more... Uh, outspoken and aggressive towards leadership in comparison with the squad. Like, what's your take on all of this? It's basically relating to force the vote controversy. And uh, for me, this comes down to a strategic disagreement. Like the squad, I wanted them to force a floor vote on Medicare for all, but they didn't. That just, you know, that that's a disagreement. But a lot of folks are using... Um, the squad's failure here is evidence that they're just like sellouts. And even in my interview with Senator Nina Turner, uh, because she said, you know, we we have to give the squad a chance and that they're not sellouts, like she was then labeled a sellout. And so I don't you don't have to comment on like the controversy and whatnot, because it's just overly stupid and divisive. And I think it's mostly more online people. But in terms of like what you do in Congress, the Democratic Party establishment is going to try to crush you. They're going to try to marginalize you in Congress. What do you think your relationship will be? Like, do you plan to be more antagonistic? Uh, give us a sense of like how you'll um, respond to the Democratic Party establishment. How I'll respond? You said they're going to try to crush me. Listen here. I'm a 34 year old, six foot eight black man who's the son of immigrants living in America. America has tried to crush me since I was born. I can walk out of the door today and get shot by a trigger happy cop. So worrying about somebody trying to crush me doesn't scare me one single bit. I'm not going to Washington to make friends. I'm going to Washington to solve problems. I don't give a damn if, if I'm blessed enough to win. If I serve one term and help better the people's life in this district, then my mission is accomplished. Mission accomplished. I am not going there to try to rub elbows with the rich or the elite or get name recognition or a book deal or a goddamn podcast. That is not who I am. That is not what I am going for. I am going there to fight. I just told you, it's not time to capitulate. It's not time to beg or to, to, to hope or pray. We have to be audacious. We have to demand. It. The times call for it. Um, you know what? This middle of the road politics, this centrist politics gets us. It gets us separate but equal, which was never equal. Middle of the road politics gets us three fist claws that said I was half a person as a black man. Middle of the road clause gets us that, you know, loving be Virginia. You can't marry a black woman. If you can, you just got to move out of states. All of these things are those middle of the road politics. I don't play that. I'm going there with a clear vision and a clear thought of mine to make people's lives in this district better. And in doing so, I will make you be making people's lives across this country better because Brooklyn, Central Brooklyn, where I'm running, is a melting pot. You can walk down the street and run into 50 different nations walking down Flatbush Avenue. That's how diverse this district is. So I know if I'm standing up for the person in Crown Heights or Flatbush or East Flatbush, I'm standing up for the person in, in Alabama. I'm standing up for the person in Tennessee and Georgia and PA. I'm standing up for that hardworking person. Now, if it come time to for, force the vote, you're damn right. We should have forced the vote. If I was there, I would have been that guy standing there telling you we need to force the vote. What are you going to say to me? What is the downside of fighting for people in my community? I don't get a committee assignment. I'm not going there for that. I don't you get a committee assignment. You got to bring in a certain amount of money and do all this stuff. OK, good. Cool. You get that. If I get one. Thank you. God bless. But if I don't get one, cool. I still have to represent the people who sent me here to Washington to fight for them. And that's what I plan to do. So I've been shot. I've been blown up. All that stuff. When I my time in Iraq and Afghanistan, what are they going to do to me? What are they going to do or say to me that I hasn't already been done or said to me in my life? Yeah, I love your answer there, because. I think that and here's what I took away from the force the vote stuff. Um, I don't like I don't agree with the fraud squad stuff. But what I do think is logical is that like it's not enough to just have the right policy positions because yes. we ha now have members in Congress who have the correct policy positions. And that's why I love the squad. The problem, however, is that we do need people who are more blunt who are willing to actually like agitate in congress and stand up to the democratic party leadership who are obstacles to progress and you saying that is exactly what i want to hear and 
it's what I think a lot of people want to hear. Like we, we already know, like every single policy, you agree with us, but in terms of like how you fight, that really is important. So like for you to say, I'm going to go there not to make friends. And if I have to make enemies, that's fine. I think that's really reassuring because now we're kind of trying to suss out like which people are running for Congress because they have the right ideas and have the right um, methods to fight to get them accomplished. And I, I love your answer there. Um, I, I wanted to also talk to you about issues that um, don't get taken very seriously. Um, so we just had the hearing on H.R. 40, which is the reparations okay. bill. Um, and I think Cory Bush is maybe the only member of Congress who's really talking directly about reparations. Uh, this is something that I, I feel like there, there's a couple of issues in the leftist circles even, not just liberals, but that leftists are bad with it. I'd say it's trans issues and it's reparations. These are the two issues that I feel like people are are too afraid to be bold when it comes to this issue. So as a member of Congress, how would you advance these issues, in particular reparations, which is now finally getting hearings, hearings which in and of itself, that's really like, that's, that's amazing. But I, I think that Tim Black put it best in a video. Like, he said he felt like these hearings, like it was a joke, like it was just lip service. It was a pat on the head. I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, of course, and that it wasn't taken seriously. So how do we actually get uh, members of Congress to take these issues seriously and not just say, you know, uh, or signal support to placate, you know, uh, members of the trans community and the black community? Because I feel like these issues, even though we're starting to talk about it, which is an improvement, like I want to actually see real action. So what do you think we can do to advance these issues and also convince leftists who in theory should be the most vocal about reparations and trans rights, but don't seem to be like, what is your take on all of this? It's kind of a loaded question, but no, not really. I mean, listen, I, I listen, and this is crazy that we're having this conversation. I talked to my dad this morning. I told you and he was talking about his grandmother, my great grandmother. And he told me when she was born in Jamaica and I was like, wait a minute. She was a slave. He's like, yeah, she was. My grandma, my great grandmother died when she was like 97. So she was born in the 1800s because my dad is was born in the 40s. And my great grandmother was a slave. My mother left Pasagula, Mississippi. She, her and my grandmother on my mother's side were sharecroppers in rural Mississippi. She left with my grandmother in 1968 when Martin Luther King was assassinated. So the Jim Crow South that we see about in documentaries and hear about in movies, my mother was 10 years old when she left that. She was spit on as a little girl. She couldn't go to certain places in town. She couldn't go out after dark. She went to segregated schools. So I don't need another hearing or another study. I can walk out of my front door and see the effects of whatever study you're going to talk about in Congress. I don't need another hearing to know that black people in this country are suffering because for 400 years we have been oppressed by our own government. The way we get more eyes to this is to have more people talking about it. And credit to Cori Bush that she is a member of Congress talking about it because HR 40 is just some obscure bill that people like you and me have the luxury of knowing because we're in the realm of politics. But if you're if you're not in the realm of politics, what the hell does HR 40 mean to you? When your member of Congress comes back and holds town halls on reparations, that's how we move the needle forward. When your member of Congress goes on TV and vociferously demands reparations for black people in this country, that's how we move the ball forward. When your member of Congress is putting forth bill after bill after bill after bill with reparations in it, that's how we move the needle forward. We elect more black people to Congress who aren't millionaires, who don't come from the, the corporate class, who don't come from the elite class. That's how we move reparations forward. My father, I just told you, is Jamaican. My last name is James. James is a British last name. That is not an African last name. So my father's people were slaves. My mother and grandmother were sharecroppers. Their last name, my mother's maiden name is Brown. That is not an African name. That was her slave master's name. And James was my father's slave master's name. I am a product of that wickedness. I am the seventh generation of crimes committed. And if we truly want to ever have equality in this country, we need more people who look like me, who come from the lineage of those descended slaves, to stand up and demand that America make right the wrongs of the last 400 years. We have a member of Congress who is a black woman in a district that's 50% African-American, mostly Caribbean, and isn't saying a damn 
thing about reparations, which is almost criminal in my opinion. That's how we move the ball forward on those things. Yeah, I, I don't understand how there's not greater urgency because it's not just like black Americans don't have a lot of wealth in this country. What little wealth they have is diminishing. So I just I don't understand how we can ever have an equitable society without being serious and having a conversation about this. And also, you know, getting left wing allies to acknowledge the importance of this issue, that it's not just a social justice issue. It's an economic issue. It's a legal issue. It's an issue that I feel like everyone who's on the left, who's progressive, who's radical, should be on board with no questions asked. Um, I so mean, it's Black History Month, right? Every yeah. black representative in Congress should have been beating the drums about reparations this month. You want to talk about black history and our contribution to this country, to American history? Well, let's talk about making right the wrongs of the last 400 years. Let's talk about that. The White House that Joe Biden is now in, when it was burnt down by the British, it was rebuilt by black slaves in this country. They rebuilt the seat of power in this damn country. And nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to talk about making right the wrongs, making generations whole. Generational wealth wasn't just kept from us. It was stolen from us. Our language, our heritage, our culture, our religion, our even our identity was taken from us. And then you leave us to fend for ourselves. You make everything we do a crime with, with the black codes, first of all, with Jim Crow slavery, with, with the war on drugs, with the crime bill, and you don't see the harm that you have caused. We talk every year about 9-11, how we should never forget it. We talk about the Holocaust and how we should never forget it. Black people have had a 400-year Holocaust in this country, and it seems like everybody has forgotten it, except those of people like me or you who have time to think about it. And we have never been made whole from this. Communities were destroyed by Joseph R. Biden. That's why I, I wrote in Bernie Sanders. He gave us the crime bill, which which was Ronald Ray, was was Reagan's war on drugs and Nixon's war on drugs cranked up to eleven. That's what made the mandatory minimums. That's what made the harsher sentences for crack. That's what literally took fathers out of homes and destroyed families, destroyed the nuclear family that Republicans love to talk about. The black people don't have a nuclear family. Well, why is that? Because a generation of men, an entire generation, were put in jail and left to rot like grapes on the vine. And America needs to atone for her sins. And we can do that with government if we have people in government who actually want to do that. Yeah. And, and I feel like there's a real opportunity here to get movement because Cori Bush, she's she's one of a few actual supporters of reparations. Like you have folks like Kamala Harris who are, you know, during the primary, she would say, I support reparations. But when you ask her about it. It's not reparations. And Elizabeth Warren was doing the same thing as well. Uh, but Cori Bush is actually saying, I want real reparations. I mean, a check. And so if you actually get members of Congress, such as yourself and Nina Turner, form this block, then that really can make a difference. And it's not a lot of members of Congress, but just having that smart that spark that could ignite the flame is really important. Uh, so yeah, I'm so glad that you said this because everything that you're saying here is important. Like you can't pretend as if like the individuals who built the system are their hands are clean. Like and that's part of the issue with I, I think like mainstream media in this country is that like you know we can criticize the system insofar as we don't touch Democrats. You know uh, we can't talk about Joe Biden and the hand that he played in building the system of, uh, of mass incarceration. Uh, we can't talk about that. And I like that folks like you, folks like uh, Nina Turner, anyone who ran for Congress in 2020, basically, that I've brought on this show, or most of them anyways, uh, they're willing to call that out directly. Because yes. if, if you can't address the elephant in the room, then you're not going to address the root cause of the issue. And, and so I'm running people... against a Democrat who's a black woman. But yeah. listen, like my grandmother, who's dearly departed, always said, all skin folks ain't kin folks. And just because you look like me doesn't mean you have my best interests at heart. We have to, if we're going to criticize the right, which they duly deserve, mm -hmm. we damn sure have to get our house in order on the left. Because mm -hmm. we're never, that's why I say I call Democrats, you know, low calorie Republicans, because they do the same <laughs> thing. Look at Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin is not a Democrat. No. Joe Manchin is literally a Republican who's running under the D name because it's easier for him to win than where he lives. Because it was a Democratic district. He's not a Democrat. Everybody knows that. And there's dozens of them in our party who take this money. Nancy, Nancy Pelosi is literally a Bush Republican. Mm -hmm. If you put her back in time right now, she is a Bush Republican. That is exactly what she is. She would be considered a moderate Republican. 
That's what she is. I'm willing to say that because look what she focuses her attention on. Think about this. Nancy Pelosi or the House voted to decriminalize marijuana months before Joe Biden got sworn in, right? That bill should have been on Joe Biden's desk day one. Kamala Harris said she wanted to make right the wrongs of sending people to jail for marijuana. We have the House. We have the Senate. Imagine how many people would not be in jail right now had Joe Biden signed that bill. There have been people who have been arrested since he has taken office for marijuana, who are sitting in jail, who are going to sit there for two years waiting for a damn court date, who would not be in the system right now if he had signed that bill to legalize marijuana. That bill should have been on his desk day one. Why wasn't it? Why wasn't a bill you knew he was coming into office? Why wasn't a coronavirus relief package bill on his desk day one? Why wasn't all these things that we're talking about on his desk day one? It's because I looked at a tweet today. Joe Biden said those checks to go out immediately if Democrats took the Senate. He said immediately. I don't know his definition of immediate, but mine is, you know, post haste to with right away. And it's been months since Democrats taken the House, January and February and the Senate. I mean, so why haven't those checks gone out? People are hurting. So the things we talk about on the right, how ass backwards they are, and they need to be criticized for allowing white supremacists to store in the Capitol, we damn sure have to get our house in order on the left because we're doing a disservice to the people we say we care about if we're, we're, we're taking the same money from the same corporate interest. Yeah. It, you know, to me, it's it's puzzling. Like the, the level of incompetence that we've seen from the Democratic Party, it's it's not like surprising, but it even like is against their own self-interest, like as rational actors who presumably want to win re-election, you'd think that they do the bare minimum at least to make sure that they assure they will be victorious in 2022, 2024. But like to promise checks and use the word very, very clearly immediately and then not get them out the door, uh, backtrack on it. Um, and also he just, Joe Biden abandoned his pledge to uh, halt deportations for 100 yep. days. He initially signed the executive order to do just that. And then a judge blocked it. And now all of a sudden it's been a complete change of policy. He could have stopped the deportations that were already scheduled to go through and just postponed them until after the, the situation uh, was dealt with in the courts. And now it's like all of these things, I just, I don't get it. Like, there's corruption, right? But corruption isn't the only thing. Like, there has to be some level of common sense to where if you do these things, if you literally spit in the, well, not literally, if you figuratively spit in the eyes of your constituents and people who you just told you were going to give them something very specific, $2,000, that's bad. Like, you're going to lose the next election. So I just, I don't even get, like, figuring out what goes through the heads of, like, the, the normal average corporate Democrats, I can't. Like, it's perplexing. On so many levels. I, I, I don't live in that space. I live in a space of reality. And I'm telling you, bro, if I could take this laptop and walk around the corner from my apartment, there is literally three or four food distribution centers right around the corner. I can walk 100 yards, 300 feet, and go to a food distribution center. There's cars lined up every single day. People are hurting, and it's, they're still hurting. Listen, the moratorium on rent ends May 1st. Those bills are due. And this isn't a cancellation of rent. This is a moratorium on rent. So those landlords are going to want all those back months of rent. Yeah. The bills are coming due, and people are hurt. People are already hurting. We stand to have another 2 million homeless people evicted from their houses on May 1st if we don't do something about what's going on right now. And the quick, excuse me, the quickest way for Republicans to retake the House, the Senate, and the White House is for Democrats to go back on everything they said. Donald yeah. Trump was such a bad person that Democrats won, but people still want more from their government, and we don't even—it's not even want more; it's we deserve more. You know, I looked at my wife's tax return. My wife uh, got her W two in the mail the other day. And I looked at how much they take out for state tax, federal tax, and in New York City, you pay local tax. Thousands of dollars every year. And here we are arguing about a $2,000 check, a one-time $2,000 check. I done already gave Uncle Sam thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars has come from my family to Uncle Sam. And here we are arguing about you giving me a little bit of that money back. You have no problem taking my money when you want it, Uncle Sam. But when we need it, 
that's when we him and when we haul. And when we, oh, wait a minute, we got to find it in the budget. You don't ask me what my budget is every month when, or every paycheck when that Social Security, that FICA, that Medicare, all of it comes out. You never say, hey, what's your budget? Can you afford it this month? Are you going to be strapped for cash? You never ask that. But when hardworking people and poor people and people who are in dire situations need it, now it's, oh, we got to wait and see. We got to run the numbers. That's the wrong answer. That is the wrong answer, in my, in my in my opinion. In anybody's estimation, that is the wrong answer. And we deserve a government that thinks like everyday people. See, because when you have people in there who've been career politicians their whole lives, who have come from the corporate sector, where it's about, you know, chopping up numbers and hemming and hawing and not caring about the actual lives of people, then this is what you get. But when you have people who are organizers and activists who live these things every day, whose wife is a public school teacher, how can I not care about public education? How can I not care about criminal justice as a large black man? How can I not care about veterans issues as a disabled veteran? How could I not care about immigration? My father still is not a citizen to this day. How could I not care about women's issues when I have sisters and a beautiful wife and a mother? How could I not care about these things? And that's what it means to elect everyday people to office because all of us are everyday people unless you're part of the elite. So if you put me in office, I'm working for you. I'm not working for the rich people because I don't know any. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's beautifully put. I I want people to get into that to that mindset of thinking, um, okay, I gave the government money that's going to be taken out of every single paycheck before yep. I even see it. There's nothing I can do about that. But what I can do is demand that they use my money to actually benefit me, my community. Uh, my country, uh, maybe spending more on bombs, uh, tax breaks for the rich, you know, socialism for elites. Maybe we shouldn't be using my money for that. And if people really took this stance, then I, I think they get a better perspective on how they're getting such a bad deal. So but this is the framework that I'm working from. The people, members of Congress, the corporate wing is not even thinking. This is why I say you have right. to think like an organizer, you have to think like an activist, because yeah. I think about things completely different than my member of Congress does. I guarantee you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, I would like to, like, pick their brains or, like, be a fly on the wall in, like, a, a psychiatrist session with members of Congress. Like, I feel like rich people are sociopaths, and I don't I don't want to get into the psychoanalyzing them, but the way that they, like, behave is so, like, bizarre to me. Like, I want to study them. Like, uh, we're, we're filming this interview on a day when uh, Mitt Romney proposed a $10 an hour minimum wage. This is a man who literally had an elevator in his mansion for his cars. For his cars. For his cars. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that. I just read that story before. Him and Tom Cotton. Yeah. I was like, this additionist and bank capital millionaire. Mitt Romney, who's worth a quarter billion dollars, is like, hey, you guys deserve $10 by 2025. <laughs> I was like, bro, if you talk about not figuratively spit, or figuratively, that's literally spitting in my face. Bro, spitting in my face would do less harm than that would. Right? It's like insulting. Like, I can wipe that off. If you don't give me a, a you telling me I'm only worth $10 in twenty by 2025? <laughs> Spitting in my face would do less harm to me. This is coming from the man who's worth a quarter billion dollars. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I, I just got to wonder, like, okay, after you've made that $100 million threshold, like, you've bought your mansion, you've got a nice, like, sweet car elevator in your mansion, you've got a yacht, you have, I, I'm sure, you know, multiple sports cars. What do you do then with all of that? Like, what do you do? Like, it's, you've accomplished everything. You, you've you won it life. Like, you don't need that much money. It's just, these people are so out of touch. It, it drives me nuts. But um, I don't want to take up too much of, of your time. So I do want to ask you, uh, for my viewers, what do uh, you need from them? What do you need from us? How do we make you successful? Because obviously having you in Congress would be a game changer. So what do we do to make this happen? Uh, well, first of all, before we end this, I want to say thank you for having me on. You were, one, you were literally the first person in my last cycle to give me an interview. The oh, first no person, to, yeah, first person to reach out and say, "Hey, uh, I'll just do an interview." And I was like, oh, I was ecstatic because I was like, "Wow, somebody wants to interview me and hear me talk about my race." So thank you for that, and thank you for always continuing to reach out to have me on. What folks can do, oh, thank you for running. They, no, they can do. A multitude of things. I know everybody's hurting right now during the pandemic. We need donations. If you can't donate, by all means, trust me, that is not a problem. I understand because I'm broke just like you. But we need, if you can spare $5 or $10 or $27, you can go to IsaiahForCongress.com and donate on the Act Blue. If you can't afford $27, if you can make it a $3 reoccurring donation, you know, that's 
three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen. That's months of three dollars. You know, the equals twenty seven. That would help because every dollar is a door hanger we can put on somebody's door. They can follow me on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, because I share stuff every single day and getting the message out six degrees of separation you never know who will see the message and who will get behind us to support us that's how we built our following from no people to twenty thousand people that's how we built our following from no volunteers to 200 volunteers from no votes to ten thousand votes is by everybody being that megaphone so you can like follow share retweet all that stuff to help get the message out there if you live in new york city if you live in brooklyn you can sign up for the email list so you can come knock a door with me so you can hand out some flyers with me so you can talk to people and see that just because I'm wearing a sport coat don't mean I'm elite. I'm just wearing this for today's interview. I'm just a regular everyday guy like you and you can help me move that message forward because this is a grassroots campaign. and It takes everybody to put their back to the wheel to get over the hump because my opponent last cycle raised a million and a half dollars. If we raised that much, we would have won, but we didn't raise that much. So I'm asking for volunteers. I'm asking for people to help spread the message. I'm asking for donations. Those three things right there. And we're starting early. You see, our election is not till June of 2022, but we're starting early right now. So come June of or come January of next year, we're sitting on $100,000 in our campaign account instead of $10,000 in our campaign account. And then we then we, we have to gear up for the fight. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you can get involved. There'll be links down in the description box um, if you're listening uh, via audio. Of course, uh, tell us what the website is. It's Isaiah for Congress, I-S-I-A-H-F-O-R Congress.com. Same Twitter handle, same uh, Instagram handle, same Facebook handle. Okay, perfect. We'll also have everything up on the screen for folks. Uh, I'm sure I'll have you on again. It, it's more than a year until the election, so we'll touch bases again. Um I'm so glad that you're running again. Uh, once you told me that you were running, I was ecstatic because this is one of those races where it's like, okay, you're gonna win, so you just gotta you gotta do it again, one more time, and, and you're gonna you're gonna win this time because you I have the I right that, strategy. I hope I am that blessed to win because, like I said, a lot of folks, and this is the thing, the, I let people in on the inside of politics. After I finished my race last time, I guess I impressed a lot of people. People reached out to me with podcast offers and TV show offers and all that stuff. And I could have took it. I, was, I don't want it. I never ran to do that. I don't want a podcast. That's not what I ran for. I didn't run for cause celeb. I ran to actually make a difference in people's lives. You know what I mean? So that's why I'm running again now because, I mean, what we talked about here is just a small microcosm of all the issues that we, we didn't get the climate change. We right. didn't really get no justice reform, housing, health care, education. We didn't get any of that stuff. We, we spent an hour talking about two or three issues. So just imagine how much stuff needs to get done that people aren't talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's such a great point. Uh, well, thank you so much, Isaiah. Uh, of course, we'll be in touch. We'll be following your campaign very closely. When you launch merch, let me know so I can rock an Isaiah James shirt on the show. Oh, we, um, got some, we got some merch. We got some stuff coming this, oh man. Just wait, wait till you see the posters and the t-shirts and stuff. It's I'm gonna excited. be, everybody just saw that, that movie, Judas and the Black Messiah. Mm -hmm. I am Bobby Seale. I'm I'm UEP Newton. I'm I'm those guys. I'm more than Malcolm X Bane. So I'm that that, that 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 aggressive progressive. I have no reason to be scared. So that's who I am, and that's why I'm running. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, you take care. Have a great day. Uh, we will continue to follow your campaign. All right. Thank you so much.